Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, Dr. Kornbluth is an idealist. He's telling you what we would ideally like, and in fact, he's shown us very nice evidence of what we get when we have achieved mucosal healing. I'm a pragmatist. I like to combine my idealism with practical advice. And the practical advice in the current age is that we can't get to healing in most of our patients. And in fact, there haven't been any trials that have yet shown us an algorithm or an approach to actually achieve it. So let's go through what we know and how uh, we can think about this. So what we just heard was an elegant lecture on why mucosal healing is a good thing when you get it, not how to get there, and not how to use it as a primary endpoint of treatment. We know that deep remission is associated with preferred outcomes. He went through a nice list of that in both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. I'll point out to you that most of what he showed you were actually retrospective assessments of outcomes and some clinical trials that looked at secondary endpoints, but nonetheless, they're important. And we also understand that when you have healing, uh, it may end up with less uh, bad outcomes like hospitalization surgery or neoplasia. Those are all true, and I think that's important for us to recognize. And I use it in practice. When I have a patient who's healed, because I've looked, because they have persistent symptoms or something else is going on, I feel very confident in telling them this is a very good thing. I like showing them the pictures and reminding them that they're going to do well based on this finding. So I'm not debating that the symptomatic patients should be investigated for the source of their symptoms. This really isn't about that. Um, that complete mucosal healing or deep remission is a good thing. We all agree with that. That's motherhood and apple pie. Uh, or that symptoms, the CDAI or other clinical trial indices actually do correlate with degree of endoscopic disease. We know they don't. So I want to make that very clear to you. If you're going to go back to your practices on Monday and think about managing IBD patients with a primary endpoint of achieving mucosal healing, you're going to have some challenges. So let me point out to you, first of all, that if you looked at that well-known uh, study, which we sometimes call the step-up or top-down study, which had no endoscopic entry criteria, patients did well when they had complete healing. The patients who got top-down strategy achieved healing more often. So it doesn't mean that you shouldn't choose therapies that are going to be more likely to achieve healing. But I want to point out to you that what you see here in terms of the follow-up of those patients where they have a lower likelihood of needing future TNF, a lower likelihood of being hospitalized, or needing steroids, is what you get when a patient has already achieved the healing. It's not looking at achieving healing as your primary endpoint. The challenge for us as clinicians is what to do when the patient isn't healed, and that's a challenge that we face. So the prospective clinical trial treating to endoscopic healing as a primary endpoint and looking at clinical outcomes has not been done yet. People are working on it. But if we wanted to know how to do this, you'd like to know how often do you get healing with your first treatment? How do you adjust therapy to get it once you're not there? How often do you need to look? And a bunch of other things that we haven't figured out yet, and that's the challenge. In addition, I think actually uh, Asher did a nice job bringing up another point, which is that we may not be talking completely about a healed bowel. We may actually be talking about a bowel that's improved or that we have partial healing or some improvement from a baseline. So it may be true that mild activity is okay in some patients. And in fact, he made that point when he showed you the colectomy outcomes from the ACT-1 follow-up in infliximab with ulcerative colitis. There's a lot of details here. As a clinician, how do you look for mucosal healing, or what do you think about? Is it just what it looks like through the scope? Might it be based on biopsies? He showed you some of the data we have regarding dysplasia outcomes. That's based on biopsies, by the way. There's been increasing interest, and we heard a nice presentation this morning by our moderator about um, radiologic efforts to look for healing and understand what to look for. And the other challenge we all face is when would you look? If you look too soon, you're going to underestimate the effect of your therapy, meaning you'll think it's not working when it actually hasn't had enough time. And if you look too late, as I'm going to show you through some follow-up of Miguel Riguero's data, you're going to lose your opportunity to heal the bowel because there may be progression of disease, especially in Crohn's. So we have some challenges in thinking about when you might look and how you might monitor these patients. We also know that in the majority of patients, the majority of patients, we can't achieve healing when they present to us with severe disease. Doesn't mean we don't in some, and we're all happy about that, but we have a lot of work to do if this is gonna become our primary endpoint. 
And again, I'm a pragmatist. I'm not saying we shouldn't be trying, but I'm here to tell you today that I think symptoms remain an important endpoint. Now, the other point about this is that we don't actually know something very simple. If you have a patient on stable therapy and you reassess their mucosal inflammation and they're not healed, and you decide I'm going to adjust the dose of that single drug they're already on, can you get incremental healing in that individual patient? We don't actually know. So here's an example of one way to think about this. If you went back to the Accent 1 trial, the maintenance trial for Crohn's with infliximab, and you looked at a secondary endpoint, which was healing of the bowel in these patients, you can appreciate that 10 milligrams per kilogram actually did achieve more healing than 5 milligrams per kilogram. We could accept that. But the question you want to know if we're going to do this is if you took the people who weren't healed on 5 and transitioned them to 10, do you get more healing? Now, you might say, well, that's obvious. They must. That's not obvious, and it hasn't been proven. So that's a good study for someone to do. We also saw this from Dr. Kornbluth, which was the EXTEND trial, which I uh, think is an important trial for us to understand, looking at adalimumab in patients who have uh, moderate to severe Crohn's. And the primary endpoint was actually looking at healing. So we're happy about this. Um, they then followed patients out for a whole year, and some of them were left on placebo, which is an interesting study design. And I want to point out to you that in this study, which looked at healing as a primary endpoint, using an effective therapy, only 27% of patients had healing at the week 12 primary endpoint, which just missed statistical significance, probably because there was open-label loading of drug even in the placebo arm. And then if you followed them out to a year on therapy, 24% of patients were healed at the end of a year. That means 76% of the patients were not healed. Okay, so if we're going to adopt healing as our primary endpoint, you should recognize that in 76% of those patients, you would need to change therapy. What percentage of them would be symptomatic and we would do what we do otherwise, which is to look for their symptoms, uh, why they're having symptoms and adjust therapy? Probably many of them, but not all. Some will have persistent disease with no symptoms, and that's what this debate really is about. He also showed you the evidence from the SONIC trial. This is our comparative effectiveness study, right? So you might argue this is the best study we've had in Crohn's, demonstrating combination therapy is superior to achieving clinical remission, steroid-free remission in patients uh, with moderate to severe Crohn's. But even in this study, the best we could do with healing as a secondary endpoint was 44%. Now I'll point out to you something that some of you may remember. 25% of the patients who got into the SONIC trial had no ulcers on their baseline colonoscopy. They were enrolled because they satisfied the CDAI criteria. So the point here is that not everybody who has active symptoms has disease, obviously, and that's sort of making Osher's point. Um, but on the other hand, even those who have active ulcers, only about 44% of them got healed in this study. So the problem here as well is that things don't correlate. He told you that as a way to argue that we should be healing people. I'm going to tell you that because as a pragmatist, I'm here to tell you that patients want to feel better, and we got to be thinking about that as well. So symptom control remains a very important part of everything we all do, and that's what you guys take care of every day. And he also showed you the differences in what healed bowel looks like. And so you've seen this already from Asher. The point is that in the studies that have been done, when they used the Mayo endoscopy score for ulcerative colitis, zero or one was counted as healed. And if you want to make an argument that we should be treating to achieve healing, you have to come to terms with the fact that if you use clinical trial data to guide you, you're going to have patients with persistently active disease, and you're going to have to think about how far will I go. You can also look back at the ACT-1 or the ACT-2 trial and see that healing was greater than actually clinical remission. So patients felt well, but they still um, they had healing uh, at a higher rate. Another way to say that is that they had a healed bowel with persistent symptoms. How do you reconcile that, and how will we incorporate that into this new endpoint? But if we don't even look at all the biological therapies, here's, here's delayed-release mesalamine. So initially, they looked at a healing with the 0 or a 1, that standard definition, and lots of patients achieved that. And they even had some statistical significance. But when we actually asked them to go back and look at an endoscopy subscore of zero, look at how few patients actually achieved a completely healed bowel. And you lost significance between different dosing regimens. So even with 5-ASA therapy and mild to moderate, you see we have a challenge to face. And most patients won't be healed, at least within the limits of our available data. Now, if you said, well, let's see how many patients are completely healed and have no symptoms, that's what we call deep remission, of course. It's only 16% in that uh, EXTEND trial with adalimumab. 
That means 84% of patients would have persistent symptoms and um, not be healed at the same time. That means 84% of patients would need some adjustment either because they're feeling lousy or because they're not healed or both if we adopt this as our primary choice of endpoints. So the last point about this is are you sure you need to look? So in the patient feeling well with normal labs, are you really going to look for the uh, absence of healing? And are you willing and is the patient willing to allow you to change therapy based on that finding? So if you decide to look, one of the other challenges we face, of course, is where and how do you grade the mucosa? So even though this has all been described nicely in the, in the clinical literature, you have to accept that there's a lot of range in the way physicians, clinicians, and others view the mucosa and will grade this. Some people would say this is partial healing. Others would say it's moderate. Some might even say it's severe. How do you know what this is, and how do you incorporate that into practice? So then the next point is really the practical aspect. Your asymptomatic patient who's not healed, either because you looked for surveillance purposes or because you really believe we should treat to healing. So first is, are they really asymptomatic? Are they taking what you've already given them in terms of their medication? We find out that lots of patients aren't. Um, are you willing to escalate the therapy? And can you achieve healing when you do so? And will the benefits outweigh the risks? And there's a lot to think about. In other words, in the asymptomatic patient in whom you're going to jump to another class of therapy, are you exposing them to more risk than potential benefit based on that incremental improvement? So if you decide you're going to do this, how do you do it? We don't have an algorithmic approach yet. There's lots of ways you can think about doing it. I would suggest to you that optimizing existing therapies and confirming adherence are important things we could be doing today. But I'll give you some examples of how this may not be possible yet. This is Miguel's study that actually uh, Asher talked about. Patients who had what we might call a curative ileocecectomy resection with a primary anastomosis, randomized to placebo or infliximab for a year. We know that the infliximab arm did much better at preventing recurrence, right? Well, what you might not remember, and what I've always been happy to talk about and give Miguel, Miguel credit for, is that patients at the end of that first year got open-label infliximab if they wanted it, from both arms. So if you look at this table carefully, you can see that people who were randomized to placebo and people randomized to infliximab were allowed to go on to open-label infliximab for another year after their initial study. And you can also see the uh, score of the endoscopic recurrence at the end of the first year, and obviously patients on placebo had more endoscopic recurrence than those who received infliximab. But you can also see here the post-trial score on the right-hand column which shows you whether or not open-label infliximab achieved more healing. Now, the point of me showing you this is to say that in these patients who had recurrence and elected to get open-label therapy for an additional one year, many of them could not be recaptured. And this might be the cleanest data set we have of this, because they were essentially cured by a surgical resection. You know what I mean by that, right? The disease was removed. They've been observed carefully for a year. And they're given therapy, those who are on placebo, active therapy at one year, and they couldn't be recaptured, and they couldn't be healed. Now, that's kind of pessimistic to hear that, but this is a very nice data set that gives us some clues about the fact that we may not be able to get many patients healed, and certainly if we wait too long to start therapy, we're going to run into that trouble. So what do you do? The other part of this question and the implication is once you've achieved healing, if you believe healing is the endpoint of, of uh, um, our perfect management strategy, you're going to need to monitor for loss of healing. And how would we do that? We haven't heard any discussion yet today of how you might do that. So you have a healed patient in your practice. You just wait until they call you and say they're not feeling well. I'm sure most of you would not do that. You're going to schedule them for follow-up, but then what are you going to do to follow them up? How often would you look? How do you know when they start to have subclinical recurrence? Or do you wait for symptoms? And how are you going to do this? So that's not been decided yet. So Asher very nicely at the end of his presentation mentioned, well, everyone's doing this in rheumatology. And I was glad to hear him say that because I'm going to show you what rheumatology is actually doing. So they're using something called treat to target. And some of you may have heard of this term already. The concept is basically um, that we are going to adjust therapy over time to achieve a specific target. In the argument and discussion we're having today, it, the target is mucosal healing. So the question is, if we believe in treat to target, does that mean we should be treating to achieve healing? Well, the idea is, if you look at the actual precepts from a consensus statement in rheumatology, there's a few things they say. The primary target for treatment is clinical remission. 
Remission is the absence of signs and symptoms of significant inflammatory disease activity. That doesn't mean any inflammatory disease activity. And they even acknowledge that low disease activity may be an acceptable alternative. And so it's possible that some degree of activity may be the best we can do, and we should be accepting that. Uh, and until the, tar the desired treatment target is reached, drug therapy should be adjusted at least every three months. That's treat to target. And the other concept is disease monitoring. So we've already been doing some of this disease monitoring. If you look at initial titration and maintenance, that's induction and maintenance. But the concept of maintenance that I hadn't heard before was this one, detecting drift. In other words, is there some degree of inflammation that's allowable over time in our patients who are otherwise healed? And if that's true, do we need to know what that is? In other words, is there a range of fecal calprotectin that we're going to allow patients to bounce up and down during? Or is there something we would find endoscopically that we would say, okay, this is all right. We're not going to go much further. None of that has been defined yet. So there's a lot of work left to do. So I'll end with this. There's plenty of room for us to improve what we're already doing and can listen to our patients about their symptoms. We know from an internet survey of patients around the country that many of them live with active symptoms of UC and they don't tell their doctor. So it's up to us to be asking and have a better way of gathering that information. And there's some emerging ways to do this at home or to have patients collect their own symptoms and report them to us. And so you can say this is a good thing or maybe it's a bad thing, but I think that there are many ways that we can incorporate symptom control and assess our patients more effectively now without saying that it's time for us to try to treat everyone to achieve healing. Because if we do that, they're going to end up on every therapy we have and still not get there in many cases. So I'll just end with the summary slide and say to you that I think that the ideal of mucosal healing is a very good thing, but the practical matter of getting there has not been clearly defined for us yet. So we have a lot more work to do. Thank you.